Hello, everyone, and welcome on behalf of the College of Arts and Sciences. I am your moderator for today, Clara Davison. Thank you so much for joining us for our first book club webinar. Uh, today, we will discuss Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen, selected because it was the most frequently recommended title by more than 100 Department of English alumni who shared their top 10 book lists earlier this year. Thank you to our Department of English faculty, Assistant Professor Jameson Cantor and Professor Claire Simmons for sharing their expertise with us today. Attendees, just a reminder that you are muted and your video is off. If you have a comment or question to add to the conversation, you can share by typing or by speaking. If you would like to type, just click Q&A at the bottom of your screen and submit a comment or question. If you would like to speak, you can click raise hand at the bottom of your screen. As, as time allows, I will enable you, your audio and call on you by first name and your last initial. A pop-up to unmute your microphone will appear on your screen. You will click OK to unmute yourself and share your remark. This, of course, is a very large group, so we will not be able to respond to every comment and question, but we will do our best to address as many as possible. So to get us started, Claire and Jameson will share some brief remarks about Pride and Prejudice, including answers to some of your pre-submitted questions. After their remarks, we will open up to the conversation. Again, please submit any comments or questions by clicking Q&A to type or raise hand to speak. Without further ado, Claire, take it away. Thank you, Clara. I'm going to talk a little bit about the context for Pride and Prejudice. Um, the basis of Pride and Prejudice is a novel that Austen completed in 1797, when she was still 21. The title was First Impressions, appropriately enough. We know that she unsuccessfully tried to publish the novel, but we don't know how much it was like the version finally published in January 1813 as Pride and Prejudice that almost immediately became a big success and re has remained popular ever since. So what about the historical context? During most of the intervening 16 years between First Impressions and Pride and Prejudice, uh, Britain had been at war with France and historical events in the novel don't give much help as to when during these wars uh, the story is supposed to take place. I think though that the references to Brighton in the novel suggest that she had updated it and the time is the Napoleonic Wars and more specifically the Regency period in which the book was published. Brighton was established as an army base after the French revolutionaries declared war on Britain in 1793. Strategically, Brighton was a good place to locate a troop of militia since it, on the south coast, east coast of England would have been where if Napoleon invaded, he would have come. That was where England was last invaded from France in 1066. The Normans came in in that area. Uh, by the time that the future George IV assumed the title of Prince Regent in 1810, he had helped make Brighton a fashionable seaside destination and also just a little bit scandalous. He actually had a wife living in Brighton, which was illegal. You can't actually have two wives at the same time. He was married to Princess Caroline of Brunswick and he had another wife in Brighton. So um, Elizabeth, the person in the novel with the most good sense, urges her father not to let Lydia go to Brighton, where, to quote the novel, where the temptations must be greater than at home. Mr. Bennett, of course, allows Lydia to go to Brighton with the soldiers and the family respectability is, as Elizabeth has foretold, threatened by, Eliz by Lydia's actions. She could potentially make all of the girls in the family unmanageable, marriageable. Uh, this is one of the multiple occasions in the book where Mr. Bennett is not a good father and I'd like to spend the rest of my time talking about how he's not helping his family as he should. Readers tend to laugh at Mrs. Bennett and imagine that she would drive them crazy, but then they laugh with Mr. Bennett's cynical view of the world and so he tends to escape the blame that he probably deserves. The famous opening sentence, it is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. It's generally assumed to be the point of view of people like Mrs. Bennett, not Mr. Bennett. But in fact, as soon as Mr. Bing Bingley is in the neighborhood, Mr. Bennett goes off to call on him and arranges for Mr. Bingley to call and return. 
he just won't give Mrs. Bennet the satisfaction of thinking that she suggested the idea. Very important to the plot is the matter of the entail, where Mr. Bennet must also take some share of the blame. I'm currently co-editing an 1823 novel called The Entail. It's called that the actual title. It's The Entail by the Scottish writer John Galt. Uh, so I'm thinking a bit about entails right now. An entail is a legal contract rather like a trust designed to keep property together. An entail means that the holder only has a life interest in the property. He, I'll come to she's in a minute, can make use of the income such as rents from farmers or his own farm produce, uh, but he can't sell the property or strip it of its assets like, you know, pictures or heirlooms or even wood, right? Um, at the holder's death, the property passes intact to the um, heir, who is usually the eldest son, and that son will have to pass it to his eldest son, and so on. Um, terms of entails differed, but they were usually strictly passed through the male line. So, since Mr. Bennett has five daughters and no son, the property passes through the male line and not to them. Apparently, Mr. Bennett's father had a younger brother who had a son, namely Mr. Collins. Now, if you think about it, there's a problem here. This would make Mr. Collins Mr. Bennett, a Mr. Bennett, because his father was Mr. Bennett and his grandfather was Mr. Bennett. Um, if we want a possible explanation beyond conceding that Austin made a mistake here, we'd have to guess that uh, the younger son, the younger Mr. Bennett, must have changed his name to Mr. Collins, probably over some matter involving inheritance. I'll just briefly address two women's comments on entails, both of which make some acknowledgement of how women are generally excluded. First, Lady Catherine de Burgh makes the observation that entailing away from the female inheritance was not thought necessary in Sir Louis de Burgh's family. Um, my best guess is that the de Burgh family had no entail of any kind, uh, but I can talk about that later if you want. <laughs> Um, second, Mrs. Bennett says, if it had been her, she'd have done something about the entail. I am sure if I had been you, I should have tried long ago to do something about it. The narrator then adds, Jane and Elizabeth had often tried to explain to her the nature of an entail, but their mother was beyond the reach of reason. Most commentators have assumed that what Jane and Elizabeth tell her is that an entail cannot be changed. This isn't entirely true. There are means of breaking an entail. Um, and if Mr. Bennett has even had thoughts about doing it if he'd had a son, which he has not. <laughs> um, so the truth is that the gentry class was dependent on entails to keep family property united. Daughters would share in inheritance. Um, it would be split equally usually among daughters and the property would have to be split or sold to give each a chunk. Um, and that would move them down the social ladder from the gentry to more like the middle class. Mrs. Bennett, whose father was a lawyer, is therefore technically correct that Mr. Bennett could change the entail, but she is betraying social class by even suggesting it. We should also note that Mr. Bennett's income is £2,000 a year, which while much less than Mr. Darcy has, is a substantial amount of money in Regency society. Mr. Bennett would have been well advised to save a modest portion each year and invest it at four or five percent interest. You could get that in those days, unfortunately, not today. Um, um, and then he could have made a will leaving the cash to his daughters. Still, I think finally, Mr. Bennett is the reader's hero because he doesn't insist on the simple solution to his problem and one that seems to be common among the gentry of that time, namely forcing one of his daughters to marry Mr. Collins and keeping the property in the family. So finally, the cynical Mr. Bennett, at least in some respects, believes in true love, and Austin finally rewards his family for it. So I'm going to stop that talk about context now, and I'm going to hand it over to Jameson, who's going to talk more about uh, ways we might connect with our own times. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Claire. Claire and I actually had a, a conversation about our kind of love hate for Mr. Bennett when we chatted about this meeting a few days ago. Maybe that could come up in the in the Q and A. Um, and thanks everyone for joining us. Thanks Clara in advance for setting this up. I, I kind of feel like I'm on the radio, but I can see myself, uh, which is a little weird, like looking into the mirror or something. As Clara said, I, I'm gonna briefly address, since she spoke about the historical context, I thought I would address briefly the applicability of the novel to our current situation. Uh, specifically what it means to socially distance uh, and to kind of live through a series of virtual as opposed to actual encounters. That's kind of what we're all doing these days. Um, 
you know, we tend to think of Austin's novels as these fundamentally social stories. Uh, they are, in fact, about society, about the formation of community uh, through affiliation with different groups, um, parties, classes, ideologies. You think about uh, the grand uh, meeting the, uh, in ballrooms, people going and shopping for Muslims together, um, playing at whist tables and all that. But in fact, the novels have a lot to say about, I think, quiet reflection, solitude, uh, and private consideration, especially when society has become, uh, I'll just put it kind of bluntly, irritating or maybe alienating. Um, I, I was, upon rereading this last week, I have my, my grad school copy of Pride and Prejudice with all of the notes in it. This is a kind of uh, OCD way I keep track of my thinking. Uh, I, I came upon this scene, and, and for those of you who I'm sure have very different editions of this, this is in chapter 10 of the first volume. So chapter 10, uh, in total, right, cumulatively, if you want to go there. One of these scenes where people are really irritated with one another because they're in close proximity. Uh, and it actually happens to kind of be a scene of quarantining. This is when Elizabeth goes to visit her sister Jane, who has stayed uh, with Bingley and company, and she's caught a cold. So she's actually sick. And they are basically making sure that she recovers. They're in the house doing their thing. Uh, and I don't have to kind of rehearse through citation what's going on. Needless to say, everyone's kind of getting on each other's nerves. Uh, Darcy's attempting to write a letter. Uh, Bingley's sister Carolyn is critiquing or kind of looking over his shoulder, uh, critiquing his style. Uh, Elizabeth's critiquing Darcy, as is pretty common in the first half of the novel. And even Bingley, who I think by all accounts is the most benevolent, maybe one of the most benevolent characters in the book, he's taking a shot at his best friend too. Uh, so this is one of these scenes where, uh, in lieu of social distancing, people forced together in a similar situation um, kind of are irritating one another. Uh, it's one of those not so great scenes of social bonding uh, in Austin. We got a question uh, about um, another scene of society that turns a little bit awkward um, or maybe even irritating. Uh, if, you'll, if you want to go to chapter 16, um, this is a few pages later. This is at the whist party in which Elizabeth meets Wickham, I believe, for the first time. Uh, and Wickham goes over uh, the backstory with he and Darcy. And um, Elizabeth starts to, to say, uh, this might in fact be in the narrator's free and direct discourse, but quote, the delicacy of it prevented further inquiry. She didn't want to hear any more from Wickham. Um, and I think the reason why she, she says this, or perhaps the narrator says this, is that it would be a real breach of propriety. I don't want to know about what happened between you and Darcy. I just met you, dude, right? Uh, we need to kind of back up and, and do this the correct way. I was thinking that propriety, which is one of this, it's a, a central category in Austin, manners, etiquette, how, how one is supposed to treat one another through custom, that is actually kind of a form of social distancing. It's a way of keeping at arm's length people that you don't know very well, uh, and then kind of leading them into that place of, or that space of intimacy. Um, so um, we have these scenes where people I think are maybe irritated with one another. Um, the final scene that I'd like to contrast, and it's a scene perhaps of solitude and distance contemplation. Um, I'm being a bad literary critic. I actually forgot to mark where this is in the book, but it's right smack dab in the middle of the book. This is when Elizabeth visits uh, Pemberley for the first time, Darcy's ancestral home. Um, and she doesn't see Darcy there uh, when she at first gets there, at least. She's taken through this kind of nice tour of the house. And what she does is encounter portraits of Darcy, two portraits, as well as uh, Darcy's wonderful housekeeper, Mrs. Reynolds, um, who gives a kind of reading of Mr. Darcy and his youth. And this is, I think I'm all right in saying, this is what starts to turn Elizabeth's opinion. Uh, of Darcy, not an actual social encounter with him, but an encounter at a distance with his portrait, uh, with his housekeeper, uh, and eventually with his, uh, his letter um, that he sends her, which she kind of pours over and has to think about. Um, I would consider these to be kind of like virtual encounters. Uh, I'm not necessarily, I hate to say it, I'm not looking at the real Clara or Claire right now, I'm looking at virtual representations. Uh, and Elizabeth is not looking at the real Darcy when she reads the letter or sees the picture. She's looking at a kind of virtual representation of him at a distance. But it does, in fact, pivot the novel in the direction that we all love. They actually end up um, together.
So that's kind of what I wanted to say about it. It's a novel that's about social bonding, but it's also about social irritation, social distance, and basically falling in love with a virtual representation of somebody, um, which works out uh, in the end. Thank you so much, Jameson and Claire. That's great. Uh, so now we will open up the conversation. Um, so again, if you had something you would like to add to the conversation, you can share by either typing or by speaking. Um, so to type, just click that Q&A at the bottom of your Zoom app um, and type in your question or comment. Uh, to speak, click raise hand, um, and then I, as time allows, will come through and enable you to speak. You'll just click OK on that pop-up that pops up on your screen uh, to unmute yourself, and then you'll be able to share your thought. Um, so to get things started, uh, one question for Claire and Jameson. Do we know how and how long Jane Austen worked on Pride, Pride, whoo, Pride and Prejudice? Um, well, as I said at the beginning, um, we know that she drafted it, a first entire book, when, in, uh, when she was only about 21 in her 22nd year, she drafted the entire novel. Um, our best guess is that she put it away for a long period of time and then she revised it um, fairly close to the time that it was published um, because, as I said, was saying earlier, it seems to have those topical events in it. Um, we don't have that much information about how she did her writing. We have one or two hints that maybe when people were having the kind of interactions that Jameson was describing. She was like sitting at a corner scribbling away at something. But um, uh, her family destroyed a lot of the biographical evidence about her. Um, and we don't think it was because, for example, there were sexual scandals. We think it's more likely it's because she said some rather snippy things about family members. That's our best guess as to why they destroyed a lot of evidence about her. And they tried to make her out to be sweet and kind and other things like that. But we can guess maybe she was pretty sharp in her social observation. And that if she was at something like the whist party that uh, James had seen, that was Jameson was talking about, she was taking careful notes and she was noting people's mannerisms and thinking that she might use them in a book. I, you know, I, I'll divert to Claire's kind of expertise on the, on the biography here. I'll, to add another Clara into the mix, Clara, Clara into the mix, that the biography that I've kind of leaned on in research is by Clara Tuit, T-U-I-T-E, I think it came out in 2012. It's a great bio and it's not super long. Um, it will dip back and forth between the kind of bibliographic history of the books and of course biography itself. Um, I've taken a couple screenshots of actually the biography, but we don't, we don't need that today. That's great. Our next question from Carol. Um, can you talk about the role of the church and religion in the novel? Mr. Collins is a strange kind of clergyman and Elizabeth would have been the vicar's wife if she had married him. What would that have meant for her and what does that mean for her friend Charlotte? I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and say that I, there is something weird about the Collins side of this family. We don't have the full story. She doesn't give us this full story. It was usual in wealthy families for a second son to become uh, a clergyman. Um, so usually the, the person who was going to inherit the property did not become a clergyman. He might possibly go into the army for a while um, or he might do nothing. Um, it was unusual if you were the heir to a property to become a clergyman. But it's possible that the Collins family wasn't wealthy and that's why he went into the, the church. Um, what we know from others of Jane Austen's novels is that being in the church was not really a very full-time commitment, uh, that they uh, seem to have an awful lot of time for swanning around. We might think about Edward Ferrer's in uh, Sense and Sensibility and, and other books like that. Um, we take it that they did have some um, religious convictions, but those are trod very lightly in the novels. Um, the most, the most uh, outspoken statement actually comes in Northanger Abbey, which is um, when um, uh, Henry Tilney discovers that uh, Catherine Morland has been imagining that there were scandals and murders going on in her family. He said, Don't, do remember we are English and we are Christians. Uh, we don't go around murdering people. 
Um, but uh, it is interesting that Mr. Collins doesn't seems to be able to do all the things that everyone else does. He's a, he dances and uh, he can propose to people. It would be normal for a clergyman to get married. That would be something he would be expected to do. And of course, he, he does that very, very quickly. Uh, like he gets refused by Elizabeth and then he proposes to uh, Sherlock like, two days later. <laughs> Anything you want to add, Jameson? Two pages later, maybe. I think it's like the next chapter or something. Maybe that accounts for the days. I agree with Clara. I, I don't see a lot about the ideology of religion coming up in the novels, but there are people who are religious figures. I mean, Mr. Elton is another one of these figures who I believe, I think Mr. Elton's a vicar in Emma uh, as well, um, who's, who's uh, he's a kind of a character people love to hate uh, as well. Um, I take that remark actually in Northanger Abbey to perhaps even be in keeping with the tone of the novel satirical. Uh, remember that we're a Christian country, don't go around murdering people. I, I mean, uh, that's up in the air, depending on how you view England's social situation at the time, and also the kind of a, the track record of Gothic novels where um, all of these supposedly Christian writers are, are putting all of this tawdry stuff on paper. Uh, so that even that could be taken uh, inauthentically in that novel. A comment from Flora, Elizabeth fell in love with a virtual representation of Darcy by the end with the letter. But remember, she also fell in hate with Wickham's virtual representation of Darcy. Uh, so the power and ability of people to curate the narrative surrounding others, especially easy nowadays, uh, re-social media is super interesting. Any thoughts there? I love that comment. I think that's exactly right. I mean, you could extrapolate. It's not just about falling in love. It's about literally how everybody gets, well, maybe not everybody, but most people get to know one another in, in the text uh, through reading and representation. We can get back to the, uh, the illustrious Mr. Bennett that we had this, again, kind of debate. Do we like him? Do we not like him? Uh, where is the place that Bennett supposed, Mr. Bennett spends the most time in the novel? Uh, that's his library engaging with uh, representations and fictions and forming his mind to literature. And whether or not this is a good thing actually can kind of be uh, left up to the reader. I, I will say uh, another moment that struck me in rereading this is when Mr. Bennett says in a moment of authenticity, he's usually pretty witty and cynical as Claire was saying, he says to Elizabeth, kind of don't make the same mistake I did in falling in love with an idealization of somebody that falls apart. I don't quite know if he says it like that, but I, re I take it that way. And you can maybe connect that to his kind of hyper reading. He believes in fantasy and abstraction and the ideal, but in a moment he breaks away from this and says like, sometimes you, maybe you actually have to see the real thing. Uh, so that's great comment. Uh, and I agree the whole novel and, and many of these novels are just freighted with people reading others at a distance. A question from Gina. Uh, in my experience, men discount Austen's works, most famously Mark Twain. So what do we make of men who are dismissive of such amazing storytelling and writing? Can I ask a follow-up to that? Absolutely. Gina, can you, I, I have never heard of the Mark Twain thing. Maybe Claire, you've heard of the Mark Twain dismissal. I know that Mark Twain dismisses Walter Scott, a contemporary of Austen, but I've never heard this. Claire, do you, do you know this comment? No, I, I definitely heard about the, the Walter Scott because he Scott. thought that Scott was responsible for a lot of things that, a lot of weird, particularly masculine behaviors. Yes. But I just thought that was mighty more sympathetic towards it. So, yeah. Uh, but uh, um, yeah, there still has is a question about whether it's manly to read Jane Austen's novels. Um, I think actually it's interesting since Scott came up, Scott said that he loved them, right? Yep. So Scott, the one who wrote the manly masculine novels said that he loved them. And he said, I, he said, I think he said, the big bow wow stuff I can do myself. Uh, <laughs> but I would leave the, the uh, delicacy to, to her. And we certainly know from, um, uh, that some of these representations are a little questionable. Like uh, for example, um, during this time period, it was thought that the Gothic novel, which, uh, um, you know, Austen was well aware of on satirizers, uh, was, a, was something that women did. But we have lots of evidence that men read them as well. And I'm guessing that men did always read Jane Austen's novels. They just did it rather surreptitiously. Um, maybe it's more difficult now because people think of the, the movies as being like chick flicks. Uh, but I think there's a, a, a strong, long... Uh, 
history of, of men reading Foster's novels as well. Yeah, I, I, I will kind of just briefly say somebody should, if there's not already a study out there, kind of do a, a reception history in the 19th century about gender, the gendered reception of Jan Austen, because I bet Claire's right. I, I bet the reception has maybe been modified in the way that Jane Austen has been modified to be. And I, I, I don't mean to use this in a kind of uh, offending way, but like a, a, a chick lit novelist, which she's not. I mean, it's just, but I think because in some ways she's an incipient f figure in the romantic comedy, and that has been marketed mainly to women, um, the novels have become gendered in reverse. So I wanna see that 19th century reception history to see how they become, became gendered eventually. So Gina let us know um, that the quote she remembers is that Twain said he hated her novel so much he wished he could dig her up and beat her with her own arm or something to that effect. Wow. Ooh, I think, I think that he was kidding. I think he secretly read them in bed. <laughs> Absolutely. That's, that's too much to be serious. <laughs> All right, well, we have a couple of questions about the movies. Um, so do either of you have a favorite movie or a TV, ap TV adaptation of the novel? I mean, I think the standard answer, I have seen it, but I think the standard answer is the 95 BBC version with uh, Colin Firth and, oh, who plays Elizabeth? Um, she was supposed to be in Game of Thrones and then she backed out. That's how I remember the actress. That's Jennifer was, Eel, I think. Jennifer Eel, thank you, Claire, that's it, yeah. Um, that's a that's a good adaptation. Um, I I like the two thousand and five Pride and Prejudice. It's got Kira Knightley in it. Um, I don't think it's I, I don't think it holds up to the BBC version. Um, but it's it's good. Uh, Claire, do you have a favorite? Um, I my favorite's the books. To be perfectly honest. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I I think it's I think there are instances where um movies can be better than books. So you just mentioned Game of Thrones. Uh, don't read the books, just watch the, just watch the movies. Um, but uh, in the case of Pride and Prejudice, I think it has to be the 1995 one, partly because it took more time to tell the story. It didn't mm -hmm. try and rush through it. Mm -hmm. I would still though have to say, um, I think I agree with the generally held view that uh, Laurence Olivier's portrayal of Darcy mm in the 1940 movie with Greer Garson. Um, although he was dressed as a Victorian man, <laughs> not, a, not a romantic era man, um, uh, I think that did influence later ones, the, the sort of uh, the proud contemptuous attitude that he, he expresses. I think that did influence late, later interpretations of, of the, in, in video. Um, uh, my objection to the 2005 one, I sort of hinted at it in, in my brief summary of the context, is uh, that uh, the Bennett family is portrayed as being poor. They are not poor. <laughs> they've got quite a lot of money. Whether they use it sensibly is an interesting question, but uh, they've got quite a lot of money um, and they, they're not poor. So from Liz, I reread the book in its entirety yesterday, and upon this most recent reading, I was amused by Austin's description of nature, especially in chapter 43, quote, the park was very large and contained great variety of ground, end quote, laughed aloud. Not sure why, <laughs> variety of ground. Uh, did anyone else pay particular attention to her description of landscape, etc.? Well, we, in the Romantic era, there was a lot of emphasis on the picturesque. Um, there's even people who apparently took around with them like mirrors and picture frames, so that when they saw somewhere particularly picturesque, they could kind of hold it up and like frame it, you know, so that they could, could look at it. There's a big emphasis on picturesque. And um, I, I think Liz is right to laugh at that. <laughs> I think, I think uh, in many ways, um, Austin is kind of making fun of the emphasis on this sort of uh, looking at uh, details. Uh, but we still have to say, um, overall, when, um, uh, when Elizabeth goes to Pemberley, we get little hints of the picturesque going on. Do you want to say more about that, Jameson? I, I, I was listening to you, but I was trying to find one of my favorite quotes 
uh, in the novel that has to do with this kind of romantic appreciation of nature. This is in volume two, chapter five. So it might be in like the 20s if you got the chapters running um, consecutively. It's the last paragraph. They, um, Elizabeth and her aunt and uncle, the gardeners, are thinking about taking a, a trip to the lake country, which of course, it was the stomping grounds and formative uh, area for the, the romantic poets Wordsworth Coleridge in their, their circle. Um, and by the time I imagine um, she's revising this novel, they've become pretty well known. Um, Elizabeth hears that they're going to the lakes and she says, uh, what delight, what felicity, you give me fresh life and vigor, adieu to disappointment and spleen. What are men to rocks and mountains? Oh, what hours of transport we shall spend. And when we do return, it shall not be like other travelers without being able to give one accurate idea of anything. We will know where we have gone. We will recollect what we have seen. And then she describes a little bit more. That could be sincere, but knowing Elizabeth, I think she's kind of making fun of the romantic picturesque here. Oh, we're gonna go and hang out with Wordsworth and Coleridge and go on these kind of effusive, effusive hyper sincere journeys with them. Um, so it's right in there. Uh, I actually think there's um, some sincere appreciation as Clara was saying in the subsequent chapters of Pemberley. And then they're lightly poking fun. Austin is lightly poking fun at the romantic appreciation of nature. So can we consider this text satire? Ooh. Claire and I, Claire, do you want to, we were talking about this. Do you want to jump in uh, on this one? Um, normally we think of satire as being more closely linked to um, sort of historical specifics, which this book does avoid. As I said, there are certain historical specifics in it, but not that much. Um, Always, I think, Austen looks at people with a slightly satirical edge. She uh, questions their motives. Um, she's inclined to allow them even to satirize themselves. I, I would agree with what Jameson just said, that in that particular part, um, Elizabeth's almost sending herself up saying, oh, I'm going to go to the Lake District and I'm going to look at rocks. And, you know, um, uh, um, she, she does need to get away, but uh, she can make fun of herself at the same time. So um, I think there's a, a kind of satire of behavior um, but I wouldn't say overall um, that when we read Pride and Prejudice, that what we come away with at the end is, uh, is satire, because ultimately it moves in the direction of comedy, right? Yeah. It moves towards a marriage. And in fact, we have a double marriage at the end. We're, we could argue a triple marriage triple. if you want to count Lizzie Room and Wickham at, at the end. Um, that's slightly undercut by Mr. Bennett sort of saying, well, I think Wickham's going to be my favourite son-in-law. But uh, it still is, it, we still do feel that romance has triumphed, that, that, that love has to be between two people who um, are attracted to each other. Um, uh, at least in the case of Jane and Elizabeth, I'm not going to say so much about Lydia, but we, we, so we, so ultimately, I think that kind of means that I wouldn't call it ultimately a satire. I think it does suggest that there is such a thing as true love. Now, we can add to that that Austen was well aware that when women marry, they give up certain things. We can think about Charlotte earlier in the book, Charlotte said, I'm going to get married. That's my only option here. I'm going to get married. She gets married to Mr. Collins and she has to make the best of it, the same as Mr. and Mrs. Bennett have to make the best of their marriage. Um, but I still feel that at the end we have romance. We saw the, the idea that people can be in love with each other. I agree. I, I think the text is one of the most author sincere maybe the conclusion of the text is one of the most sincere in Austen. If anything, I think the satire has to do with the context that Austen is looking at, women's conduct manuals, certain styles of education, um, but the novel itself doesn't read to me as a kind of rich satire. Like Northanger Abbey, I take, is a real satire of Gothic novels throughout. But Pride and Prejudice, it's, um, it's happy and sincere by the end. So the, uh, this is a question from Beth. Uh, the outer female characters, so Mrs. Bennett, aunt, sisters, neighbors, Lady Catherine of this novel, all seem to have different lives. Are these representations of Elizabeth's possible futures? Mm. 
counterfactual Elizabeth. Well, I, I can't speak to that question directly. I have to think a lot about that, but it's a really great observation. One of my, my favorite um, professors in grad school said that um, one of the pleasures of reading Austen is to know that there are like 30 other novels being written behind the main characters. Uh, and sometimes the hints of those novels come up. We, we start to see the stories filled in uh, in the, uh, maybe we should call it the foreground of the novel, but in the background, there's all this other stuff um, going on. That might be one of the reasons why we have so many progenitors of Austen, people like filling in the work, writing spin-offs of Austen uh, and, you know, other counterfactual situations. Um, Claire, do you think that, that Lizzie sees her various futures and the other women characters in her orbit? That's a really wonderfully framed question. What do you think? I, I was assuming that she was seeing her future when she went to Pemberley. Yeah. That she was seeing her future in what Mrs. Reynolds said was, sure. was usual at Pemberley, which was to help other people like Wickham's father and the people who live round about to try and improve the estate, something which uh, Mr. Bennett doesn't seem to do. He doesn't seem to have really any hand in managing his property. Um, and that they will, she will become a rather benevolent lady. Now, this does mean that by the Victorian period, <laughs> Uh, we imagine her sort of 20 years down the time. She's going to be one of those interfering charity work ladies of whom uh, Dickens makes fun. But um, I think that's where I would see her future, which is that she's going to be um, uh, a lady of the manor who's actually going to try and help people. Uh, now, we also would assume that she is going to stay pretty much in touch with her family. Uh, that, that she'll have to help them out from time to time because uh, Lydia and Wickham are just going to get into more and more messes so presumably she's going to have to deal with some of that but I, I think one of the things about Pembley is it's not just when she goes there she thinks oh I could be rich but she also thinks there are ways to be rich and also do something productive so that's what I, I see see the future of, of her being, that she will think about things, the ways that being wealthy actually helps you contribute to society rather than simply destroy it. Yeah. Just a final thought about uh, protagonists, women protagonists seeing the future and other women in their orbit. Uh, I think a really good example is not in Pride and Prejudice, is in Emma. Uh, when Emma has this kind of... Um, for lack of a better term, bizarre relationship with Miss Bates. It's a pivotal relationship. If you, if you all remember, um, kind of the climax of Emma is when uh, Emma herself really insults Miss Bates and then she is scolded by Mr. Knightley. You could kind of read that scene in different ways. Um, but Mr. Knightley actually implies that at one time, Miss Bates was kind of like the Emma of the village. You know, she was the Emma of her time. And um, it is, in fact, incumbent upon um, these women to actually recognize their future selves in others. Uh, so that's a great question, not the least of which it applies to Pride and Prejudice, but actually that's kind of all over Emma and the, the Miss Bates relationship. A question from Jeffrey. Could you please say more about the innovations of Austen's writing style? Hmm. How did she move forward the writing style of novels? Um, is it correct that she was among the first to move out of the head slash mind of the character, Lizzie at least, uh, in English lit? Well, um, we do wonder if some of the first drafts of her novels were in the epistolary form, where they were yeah. written simply as letters. Uh, that may have been the case of first, with first impressions. It seems very likely to have been the case of the first draft of Sense and Sensibility that was written as an epistolary novel where you, you have people writing letters backwards and forwards to each other, basically constituting the entire novel. Um, I do think that she goes further than most of the writers of her time in trying to internalize thought, having what we call the indirect dis indirect discourse where we see what people are thinking. Um, I think she goes further than that, but I wouldn't say that we could claim that she originated it. Yeah. Um, around about this time, we see other authors 
using a, a similar kind of thing. Scott would be um, uh, an example. His first novel comes out about the same year as Pride and Prejudice Waverley comes out about that point as well. Um, and we see some of that going on in his novels. Um, the obvious difference between um, a Scott novel and an Austen novel would be that uh, a Scott novel is tied to specific actions, certain historical events. And if you list the number of events that happen in uh, Jane Austen novels, they're actually very small, right? They're, they're sort of not major momentous events. Um, in, in this book, the sort of most dramatic thing is, uh, is Lydia leaving with, with Wickham. And that can't be described as sort of uh, um, a major action. So the real question is, how do you make a, a novel that is primarily about everyday life. Now, the understanding was that novels were about everyday life. There was a, made a distinction between novels as being books about everyday life and what was called, at that point, called romances, which were books about adventures. Um, but uh, um, we're getting more into uh, focusing on character here than in most previous novels. Now, uh, we're not 18th century people because I'm sure there's some 18th century scholars who disagree with us on that and say it happens in fielding or something of the sort. But we're, largely we would say that she is innovative, innovative in focusing on the development of character in this kind of way. Uh, I just want to say actually to connect Scott and Austin again and the, um, uh, the inciting action uh, or the, the, the action packed nature of Scott uh, when Wickham and Lydia um, run off with each other, they go to Scotland, right? I wonder if that's maybe a little bit of a, a reference to Scott and the, the hyperactivity of those uh, historical novels. I'll just add something really quickly because Claire gave a great kind of historical rundown of, of the style. I'm always struck at the, um, the diverse nature of the style, of the heterogeneity of Austen's style. Of course, she kind of originates free and direct discourse. And she starts by writing uh, epistolary novels and you'll, you'll see that come out sometimes. A lot of people reading letters in the text, um, but you also have subtle stage directions in the text, sometimes stage directions that are offered through um, exchanges and dialogue. So in some ways she's writing kind of dramatic or theatrical prose. Um, she's writing an incipient realist prose. Um, she's writing, she's still kind of writing the epistolary. And on the margins of the text, you do have these kind of historical events. They're, absolutely not up front, as Claire was saying. But if, if you look for them, they're there. And so she's kind of writing a very light version of historical fiction, too. Um, so there's a lot of just stuff, a lot of different stylistic things happening in the books. We have several questions about character motivation. Uh, so the first from Allison, something that has always interested me is the motivation behind Wickham's decision to elope with Lydia. Was it revenge, like Darcy said it was when he attempted to elope, when Wickham attempted to elope with Georgiana? And if so, um, was it revenge on Darcy or revenge on Elizabeth? Is there more to it than just revenge? Well, it's gotta be revenge on maybe a little of both, right? Um, I mean, I, I think the first reading is that it's revenge on the Darcy families, both uh, Darcy family, both uh, Darcy and Georgiana. Um, but I think he's probably taking this then out on the bed. He's able to get back at both families at once, uh, I think. Uh, Claire, what do you, what do you think? Um, the, the problem with it is that at the point when he runs away with Lydia, he actually thinks he's, that he's convinced Elizabeth to hate Darcy. So it's not very good revenge on the Bennett family or the, or the Darcy family if he doesn't know yeah. that Elizabeth and Darcy are kind of destined to come together. Um, and obviously the, the irony is that it helps bring them together because it That's helps right. Elizabeth see that Darcy is not just proud, but he will help people. Um, so the book is very clear in saying multiple times that uh, Lydia threw herself at Wickham. Now, from our modern sensibility, this doesn't work, right? She's 16, he's an adult. We wouldn't say that works. Uh, we have to recognize that 16 was considered marriage marriageable age, 
Um, but I don't really feel that the book can even, the, even the book can use that as an excuse, which is um, he threw, Lydia threw herself at him and therefore um, he couldn't resist. I think we do have to assume that there's something going on in Wickham's brain thinking that there will be some advantage to him in some family or other if he can run away with Lydia. I'm assuming he thinks that uh, Mr. Bennett has got some cash mm -hmm. and that he will throw some cash at the relationship. Uh, it turns out that Mr. Bennett has a teeny bit of cash, but not very much. So I think they arranged for them to have a hundred pounds a year or something like that. Yeah. But um, uh, I don't believe, uh, as obviously the person asking the question doesn't believe, that this is just out of true love. There's something to do with uh, some some calculation going on in this move on Wickham's part. A question from John about Mr. and Mrs. Bennett. Can you talk about the relationship between Mr. and Mrs. Bennett? Were they from different social classes and married for love? And if so, how does this relate to Lizzie marrying for love? Hmm. They are from slightly different social yeah. classes because um, uh, Mr. Bennett has Longbourn, which has an income of two two thousand pounds a year, which is quite a lot. Um, and uh, Mrs. Bennett's father was like a, a local lawyer. He was a solicitor. He sort of did basic legal contracts in the, the local area. And the implication is that she was really good looking um, yeah. and uh, Mr. Bennett married her. We don't have a sense about what their relative ages are, whether he's older than her or not. Um, uh, I'm guessing they're both they, they were both relatively young when they married um, and they, cause they have five daughters in very quick succession over a course of seven years. They have five daughters as far as I, my map calculates. Um, um, so we take it that uh, uh, Mr. Bennett does know something about love. He marries somebody uh, because he's attracted to her. Uh, not because she's wealthy, although she's, she's, she's not totally impoverished. She has a little bit of money. Um, so he does know something about love and he does know that he and his wife don't really have many common interests. Um, you would think they could make their common interest their kids, but they don't seem to do. <laughs> yeah. Not to blight the literal storybook ending of a, of a Darcy and Elizabeth, but maybe to put a little bit of gloom on it. I, I still kind of see a bit of Mr. and Miss Bennett in Darcy and Elizabeth insofar as yes, they, they do have this kind of face-to-face -face resolution at the end where they, they kind of like retell the story of their falling in love. It's a weird moment if you actually think about it. They like redo the novel Pride and Prejudice for us. Like, what'd you think about our novel together? Like, what'd you think about us falling in love? It's an odd moment. Um, but again, I, I wanna kind of, I'm leaning on this a little hard today, but Elizabeth really does kind of fall in love with an appearance of Darcy the appearance in the letters, the appearance in the, in almost the photographs, in the pictures, the appearance through people who knew him, granted, and that's not quite an appearance, that's a kind of uh, eyewitness account maybe. Um, but I'm not quite sure that she's not also sort of making the same mistake that her father did, if you want to call it that. And he says that by his own admission, as Claire said, he says, I married somebody who was really good looking and you shouldn't do that because that's, tran you know, that's a transient thing. Um, and, you know, time and again in the novel, uh, everyone is commenting, especially Mrs. Bennett, on how tall and handsome Darcy is. This happens again and again. And so uh, it is a storybook ending, but there are shades of that warning that Mr. Bennett offers uh, to Elizabeth in her coupling with Darcy by the end. Don't want to get, I'm sorry to make this kind of gloomy for people. It's a beautiful summer day, but, you know, that's there. And what are your thoughts? This is a question from Lisa. What are your thoughts on Charlotte Lucas? It is difficult to believe that Elizabeth could reconcile her decision uh, to reject Mr. Collins in their friendship. Yes, it is interesting that relatively soon afterwards, um, uh, Elizabeth goes and stays with them and witnesses their relationship. You think she might at least say, you know, maybe we'll give it a little while, just send her a, a note at Christmas time or something, rather than actually going to stay with them. 
Um, as, I, as I said earlier, um, Charlotte is absolutely open, right? She's just absolutely open. She says, uh, marriage is the only option that I have. Um, I will marry somebody who can physically provide for me. So she knows that Mr. Collins has a house. She knows he has enough income to support the two of them. And that at some point <laughs> he will inherit Longbourn, right? So, so she knows all those things. Um, uh, it does seem interesting that Elizabeth would want to go and stay with them, but perhaps she genuinely has the sort of inquiring mind. She wants to see how this is working out. And uh, when she gets there, right, perhaps it would have been worse if she got there and she found that they were madly in love. <laughs> um, she realises that um, the way that their marriage is going to work is that essentially they'll keep themselves to themselves. You know, they'll have dinner together, but they'll do whatever it is they want to do most of the rest of the time. Um, and uh, maybe again, I, d I don't want to. I don't want to be as gloomy as Jameson. <laughs> There's this possibility that if she's in Pemberley, and so is uh, um, and so is Mr. Darcy, um, they they can also have their own lives. They can do. They have the means to do what they want to do. They can spend as much time together as they like, or as little time together as as they like. Um, and I, I do think, again, as I said earlier, when we were talking about satire, if there is something, a little bit of a satirical edge, we have to recognise that um, um, women do give up stuff when they marry, right? Uh, they get stuff, but they also give up stuff when, when they marry. Yeah. I don't have much more to say uh, about the Mr. Collins, Charlotte Lucas pairing as much as it's a, a very authentic moment of the text where she says, I kind of have to do this. Um, I don't know. I, you know, I don't, I don't really see Elizabeth as, I think she kind of recognizes that that's okay. I, I don't really see her as, as bristling at this. Maybe there's a point in the novel where she says, oh, that was quick. There's a moment where she says, oh, that, that happened extraordinarily quickly. But then she actually gets over that pretty quickly as well. And as Claire was saying, there are disparate motivations in her that maybe uh, impel her to go visit them soon after. I want to ask maybe, Claire, do you remember, I was trying to work this out in my mind, she at this point, when uh, Charlotte Lucas and Collins marry, does Elizabeth know that Darcy is related to Catherine de Burge? Does she know that? Or does this come up when she visits them? Maybe our panelists or our, get, uh, our participants actually uh, can remember this as well. I, I wanna get the time correct because that would then give credence to the idea that she's also trying to get closer to Darcy and not just Darcy, but the entire, the family, the class. Liz, who I believe reread the entire novel yesterday says- Okay, Liz. So she knew, she knew that Darcy, okay, good. It's related, yeah. I think Mr. Great. Collins brought it up at some point. Yeah, he, he must. So, yeah. so yes, possibly that is a motive that she thinks she, she might be moving more into Darcy's circle, although that would be something we'd have to say that she's not even admitting to herself at that point. Yeah, I mean, we, we think of Elizabeth as maybe the avatar as somebody who falls in love and love, it, it's love, not money. But, you know, if you kind of look at it this in this way, she's getting closer and closer to the center of, of gentrified power by going and, and visiting. And Mr. Collins is pretty odious. I mean, she doesn't really like him very much. He's obviously good friends with, with Charlotte, but um, that's a little bit of a cynical way to read that visit as well. And uh, that knowledge is transferred at the Netherfield Ball for anyone who's, who's keeping track. Awesome, thanks. Um, so is Darcy really so dismissive of Elizabeth's charms at their first meeting, or do you think that even then he is attracted to her? Well, I think we should, we can, I, again, didn't mark this moment, um, but the great reveal is when they're talking to each other at the end of the novel, and I think he's rehearsing um, why he fell in love with her. Um, I think he says something to the effect of this is a little bit of a pose um, that, you know, I kind of tend to push people away to see how they'll deal with it. And um, earlier in the novel, Bingley even admits this. He says, you do this to people all of the time. You have this kind of stoic pose, but really it's a way of 
you figuring out if they're authentic, if you can actually trust them, if you actually uh, like them. So I, I tend to be pretty positive on Darcy, even though he, uh, he's admittedly rude, um, that this, he, he is attracted to her and it, this is the kind of thing that he does. Um, he says it at the end, I believe, and I know that Bingley says this to him at one point, uh, kind of your best friend who can give you uh, uh, tough love and good advice. So I think we have time for one more question. Uh, I know we weren't able to address all of your questions, but there's some really great stuff uh, in here. Um, and so we'll, we'll make sure uh, to share with everyone in the follow-up. Um, but last question, why does Pride and Prejudice endure? Why is it important? I think it provides a model for a number of things. Um, one, as we said before, it provides a model for the kind of book where we're as much interested in people's motivations as we are in their actions. Mm. Um, and I think that's something uh, that's really important. We, we want to know how people work rather than necessarily what they do. So I think it's important that way. Uh, but I think also we can say that um, uh, many romance stories have borrowed a structure from it um, and people enjoy going back to the original. Um, if you like watching romance movies, uh, the Hallmark Channel is a, a good example. Um, the, uh, the structure very often is that there's a basic misunderstanding between a very attractive woman and a very attractive man. Um, and something has to bring them together. Um, that's, uh, you know, something that people enjoy watching. They know how it's going to work out. They know at the end they're going to get together, <laughs> but they still want to watch the working out of that story. So, so I think it does, endure as sort of the prime example of a romance between two very attractive people who come to an understanding. I, I know that's an oversimplification of the novel, but the fact that people want to go back to the novel again and again suggests that they are getting something more than just simply that plot. They're getting something about how the story is told. I want to pick up on Claire's point about them coming to an understanding and why the the novel is so, uh, endures so much. The novel is really about people just misunderstanding one another over and over again and not knowing each other's motivations. Um, and I think the reason that it endures is that readers um, are put in the position of having to figure out those misunderstandings again and again. They're incredibly subtle. Um, people don't understand what, what one another are saying oftentimes. Um, letters are misread and then reread. Uh, and so I think the reason why the novel endures is that we want to reread it because we want to understand the misunderstanding. I'm, I'm sounding very much like a, a English professor right now, but that's kind of like what, what the novel is about. We want to dig in to understand why people are misreading one another and then how at the end, as Claire said, they start to read each other correctly. They come to a, a, an understanding of one another. Um, just the final thing I'll say is that in comedies, whether it's the kind of light hallmark rom-com or really kind of highbrow comedies, a real basis of comedy is misunderstanding and how it's resolved. How do we re resolve our misunderstanding of one another? And Pride and Prejudice is just loaded with it. Um, and for those of y'all who are reading and rereading it, sometimes in a single afternoon, as one of our participants said, that's amazing. Um, I imagine that's part of the pleasure of the novel. Fantastic. Uh, a thousand times thanks to all of you for joining us today uh, and to our Thank fantastic you. panelists, thanks, Claire and Jameson. Um, we hope you all can join us for our next book club, uh, which will be a conversation about Middlemarch by George Eliot on July 1st at 4 p.m. Eastern. Uh, you'll receive all this information in a follow-up email as well. Uh, but thank you all, and we look forward to seeing you soon.